he's saying all can come, all can hang out with me. Jesus is shaking up the status quo. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He saw your first breath before it happened, and he knows your last breath before it ever ends. God delivers, God saves, God rescues. I think that's cool. I got chills. There was no disease. There was no disposition or depravity that can separate you from the love of God, which is yours through Christ Jesus. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, good morning, church online. Just a quick question. Is there really anything better in life than to become the regional manager at Dunder Mifflin uh, Scranton? <laughs> Pull that up for me. There it is. There it is. Uh, now, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, um, I'm referring back to this epic uh, American mockumentary TV series that ran from 2005 to 2013 called The Office. Uh, where are my Office fans at this morning? Okay, a few, uh, a few of us. Um, the Office. It was this. It was this single camera setup, you know, and, and it was it was portrayed. It, it captured the everyday work lives of just typical employees with one camera and it was made to look like a, a documentary and and the people there they worked at this fictional paper company and the, the paper company was called Dunder Mifflin Dunder Mifflin and so this is the this is the the office and um, as we watched the office there was uh, this epic manager uh, Steve Carell who who uh, played the play the mic Michael Scott here here's uh, this is prison mic actually um, but he was the manager of Dunder Mifflin Scranton, and as we watched, he was the manager for the majority of the uh, nine seasons, but um, at viewers, as we watched him, we, we came to this realization as he left the show that it filled this major gap, this big vacancy, um, and, and we learned that not all regional managers are created equal. Not all regional managers are created equal. And so I want to take you just through memory lane for just a second. If you may understand this, you may not, and that's okay. Um, just want to show you some of the, the, the regional managers that was there. So first we had um, one of them, at least, was D'Angelo Vickers. This is D'Angelo. He was terrible at speeches, but great at juggling imaginary um, balls. D'Angelo Vickers. Next we have uh, Creed Bratton, and he was this uh, former hippie deviant who ended up faking his death, not good management material. Uh, there was also uh, Nellie Bertram. She was rude. She was crass. Uh, she was just professionally inept to, to be a manager. Another was Charles Minor. Charles Minor was a no-nonsense kind of guy, and uh, he was eventually fired along with the rest of corporate. And there was a lot more, but one that we can't forget, of course, is Robert California. Uh, Robert California, he was... Um, he had this manipulative personality, and he had uh, an innumerable amount of unhealthy appetites that eventually led to his demise. And, and so I'm showing you this because this was some of the worst management of all time. Some of the worst managers that had ever come along. And, and, and even if you've never seen The Office before, I'd, I'd probably bet that most of us um, who are here in this room and also watching online this morning, we probably dealt with... Uh, a bad boss at some point, uh, a, a shady supervisor, someone that we didn't really uh, connect with, whether it was a personality crash or whatever. We've all probably been in that experience where we've had bad management. Don't say amen this morning to that. Uh, but I'm reminding you of that moment, or if you've experienced before, and through these characters uh, of this bad management, because as we look at Mark chapter 12 this morning, as we turn back again to where we came from last week, uh, what we're going to see is that God is dealing with some terrible management over his temple. And so really, uh, it's really a group of office Sanhedrin. The religious leaders are a lot like this um, the, the office characters that had poor management styles. And so I want to recap really quickly on the, the Sanhedrin and, and what they were. The Sanhedrin, they were this religious uh, group of leaders. And, and the Sanhedrin wasn't like the Pharisee country lay preachers with Brother Bill, all right? The Sanhedrin were the elite. They were the, the genealogically pedigreed, all right? They were the most brilliant uh, of the bunch. And it was a compilation in Jerusalem, at least, of 71 at the time, 71 uh, leaders who came together, and what they did is they basically um, directed all of rule for all of Jewish life. And so they said how things would be. And the, the Sanhedrin, they had a corporate headquarters, and the headquarters was the temple. Pull that up for me, Ted. The temple, which we've been talking about that for the past few weeks. It wasn't in Scranton, but it was in Jerusalem, and that was where their headquarters 
was, and, and, and the temple, um, I bring it up again today because this was more than just a house of worship for the Jewish community. It was more than just a house of, of, of worship for them. Um, it, it was the temple, it was similar, um, it was the capital building almost in, in their nation, in the nation's capital, Jerusalem. And so the Sanhedrin, they would operate similarly in, in some ways at least as to our Supreme Court, except for it was a lot less appeals and a lot more verdict that came, that came out from there. But here was the problem. The Sanhedrin had forgotten that they were supposed to be the managers of what God had built, what God had designed, and what God had envisioned with the temple. And, and, and so Jesus, as the rightful owner of that, last week he, he literally shows up into the temple and, and they point their finger in Jesus' chest and, and they tell him to get out. Literally, God in flesh shows up in, in what he has created, designed, built, and envisioned, and they kick him out, or they try to kick him out. And so they reject God's authority. They reject God's authority, and they assert themselves instead in this place of authority. And they look at Jesus, and they say, dude, you, you don't have the authority here in, in this place. And they tell him to, to, to get out. And, and so this is, the Sanhedrin has become this group of some of the worst um, management on, on planet Earth. And last week we ended with them standing um, before Jesus in, in this huge humiliation. There was this big crowd and they had locked horns with, with Jesus. And, and the reason is because anytime you and I, anytime we look at God and, and say, hey God, you don't have any jurisdiction here. Over any, whatever part of area of, of life that is for you. Whenever we say that to God, what we found out last week with Pastor Cody is that um, God will expose us just like he exposed the Sanhedrin. And so that whole conversation has just ended with the Sanhedrin, with Jesus is talking with them, but there's still a crowd. And so Jesus, what he does in Mark 12 is he turns to the crowd and he begins to teach them uh, through this this parable. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to go to Mark chapter 12. We'll read verses 1 through 12 together. That's where we're picking up at. This is week uh, 50 of the gospel according to Mark. Yeah, we're over the hill. Happy birthday. Um, and so I'll give you just a second to get there. If you have a Bible, something just incredible happens when our eyes connect with the scripture. And so if you have it on your phone, you can pull it out or just a Bible in front of you. Mark chapter 12, 1 through 12. Uh, do you love Jesus for us, church? Amen. Are you ready to study his word this morning? Amen. Let's read this together. Mark 12, 1 through 12. This is what it says. And he began to speak to them in parables. And this is the parable. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press. And he built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Verse 2. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he said, sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another and him they killed. So with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. Verse 7, but those tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. Verse 9, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the capstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 12. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him, and they went away. Jesus, throughout the Gospel of Mark, has been doing this a whole lot, where he's been teaching in these parables. And if you haven't been with us, I kind of want to, before we jump into our, our text, I want to remind you of the, the purpose of these parables. Whenever Jesus is is teaching them and speaking them to the crowds. The whole idea uh, behind the parable is that Jesus would reveal a truth or some multiple truths, but and some people would be able to receive that truth, and simultaneously others would be blinded to that truth. 
That's the kind of the purpose, the whole idea behind the parable that as Jesus says it, some are going to catch it and understand what he's saying, but then intentionally some others are going to hear the same parable and they're going to have no idea what Jesus was, was talking about. And, and so whenever his hearers are listening in to this parable, what they're doing in their mind is they're forming a picture. They're forming a, a, a word picture in, in their mind and, and, and this comes uh, especially from the Old Testament as um, Jews would, would typically build these word pictures in, in their mind. It's the idea of meditation in the scriptures that as something is said, we, we build this focus around the, the words. And it can be a little bit difficult to navigate this morning. So what I want to do before we jump in is I want to kind of give you a cheat sheet to help you better understand this parable of Jesus. I'm going to give you a little cheat sheet, kind of a who's who of what's happening in the parable this morning, and I, and I hope that it will help you out so that you could be able to see what Jesus is saying through this, this parable of the, the grape garden, through the vineyards. So let's start um, with number, number one, the first one. Let's start with the vineyard itself. Um, the vineyard itself, in the Old Testament especially, the, the vineyard is used multiple times, multiple places to um, represent Israel, to represent the temple, to represent God's chosen and adopted people in the New Testament. So the vineyard in our story, this is a rep- representation of, of that temple. And, 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 and let me ask you on that temple, who was it, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, who was it that built, envisioned, and designed the temple? Who was it? Right, God. Right? Sunday school answer, God, from way back, right? God, he's the one who built it. He's the one that envisioned it. He's the one that that designed it and and put it into place. And so you'll remember this God, he went to Abraham, right? And he said, Abraham, hey, you're going to, I'm going to put my blessing on you. You're going to have more sons than sand on the seashore. And so God, in this sense, God is the owner. God is the owner of the vineyard. He's the vineyard owner. Next in our story, um, God, he, he needed... Some, some people to manage the temple. He, he needed some stewards. He needed some foremen. The text calls them tenants, as we already talked about. And here, in this story at least, the tenants, they represent the Sanhedrin. They represent the religious leaders of that day. They're the, they're, they're, they're the managers. They're the ones that have leased this property that, that they're supposed to manage. And, and this grape garden, the whole, their whole purpose in the garden, in the vineyard, is to produce fruit. Say fruit. We talked about this too, right? Fruit, fruitfulness, this is equivalent to faithfulness. And so as they were managing God's temple, they were supposed to produce some fruit. They were supposed to help mature the grapes uh, uh, along, so to speak, in the vineyard. And this isn't happening. So what, what happens is along the way, God, he sends out some servants. He sends out some messengers on his behalf to speak on his behalf um, to the people, to the tenants, and the servants are, are God's messengers, uh, the prophets. This is uh, hundreds of servants over thousands of years coming on God's authority to speak on his behalf. This is Elijah. Um, this is Elisha. This is Isaiah. This is Ezekiel. This is Jeremiah, culminating with John the Baptist. God has sent these messengers to come on his behalf in this parable. And, and, and so as these servants or these messengers come along and, and say what God wants them to say, uh, we see the tenants reject the servants. And so in a final act of grace, God sends a final servant, uh, a beloved son. A beloved son. And the beloved son is Jesus who is sent. And so quick recap on this cheat sheet for you. Vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. The vineyard is Israel. It's God's people. The owner of the vineyard is God. The tenants or the the managers, they're the religious leaders. The servants are the prophets, God's messengers and mouthpieces that are speaking on his behalf. And then finally, the beloved son represents Jesus. And and so as we jump into our, our text in just a moment, what I want you to do is I want you to use this cheat sheet to help you build this word picture in your mind. That as we read through this text and talk about it and discuss it today, that you would form this picture in your mind that Jesus is trying to paint for you. And my hope is that you wouldn't be blind to it like the religious leaders ultimately were. I want you to meditate on it and and, and chew it up and, and go, God, what are you saying to me through this parable? Who is it that I am from this story? 
And no matter what baggage you've brought in here today, it doesn't matter because I promise you that if you'll sit down on this scripture with me this morning and say, God, would you speak to me through it? That just as the scripture says, that he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And that will happen this morning. And then also, hopefully, we, won't, we can steward the things that God has given us to steward better. And uh, maybe not be a church full of Robert Californians, Cody. Right. So we'll pray, and then we're going to go verse by verse through this garden story. Jesus, thank you for, thank you for loving us. God, speak to us this morning through your, through your word. Holy Spirit, we come to you. We, we believe in you. We believe in the work of your ministry. We know that you are the inspirer and author behind these words and that really God, apart from you, we can't even understand what it's saying. And so we need you, Holy Spirit, this morning to teach us, to, to show us what it is that you're saying and, and to shine the spotlight on Jesus, who's the hero of this story and of our lives. And so, Lord, we just pray for your power this morning, that Holy Spirit, you would come and, and bring that, the, the comfort and the peace and then the power that you possess. Open our eyes and open our hearts, Jesus, so that we might not reject you. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So get, get your cheat sheet uh, handy with you. you. can You can write this down if you got some notes, or you can write it down in your Bible if you want. Chris can probably recommend a great pen to write in your Bible. He loves writing in his Bible. Um, so verse 1 is where we're going to start at this morning. Verse 1, he, Jesus, began to... Uh, teach them, talking about the crowds, in parables. And this is the parable, the first part at least. This is a man planted a vineyard and put a fence or a wall around it, and he dug a pit for the wine press. The wine press is the place where you press the grapes into juice. And he also builds a tower so that he can keep a lookout over his vineyard. And then he leases it. The text says, and leased it to tenants, and he went or moved into another country. Right off the bat here, this is Jesus referring, alluding back to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And what we read, what we just read here is that there was a man who envisioned and designed and built and planted a vineyard or a grape garden, a grape farm. And in Matthew's gospel, this same story, Matthew reverses to this man as the master, the head of the household. And so we know that the man here, he's the owner of the, the vineyard. And so after the man or the owner builds out his farm, we, we see in the text that he actually never intends on, on living there because after it's completed, after it's built, it says that he moves, he goes into a, another country to live, and he ends up leasing out his vineyard to some tenants who are supposed to, to manage it. And now this, this relationship, this tenant farming relationship, it was really common. It was a common practice in Jesus' day. And so when Jesus' crowd, when the crowd hears Jesus telling this story, they're going to be able to identify with what Jesus is talking about. In its basic, most basic nature, this is a business venture, okay? In its most basic nature, this is a, a business venture deal. And so because it's a business deal, that means that there would have been a contract or an agreement between the, the two parties. And here was the terms of their agreement. Verse 2 it says this, when the season came, he sent a, a, a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Right? This is an agricultural society. There's no Venmo. There's no Apple Pay. They're not paying in cash for their Rent. So what they had come to in this agreement was that they would pay the owner back uh, their rent in a portion of the harvest that, that was brought forth in the very end. That's how they were going to be able to pay to lease the land. And some of the results were supposed to be fruit from the, the vineyard. So whenever the harvest would come, this absentee landlord um, was going to show up, come in, and collect what was rightfully his to take. Now, right off the bat, we see here that this owner, that he's a generous owner. He's a generous owner to, uh, and generous to the tenant managers because they don't, they don't buy this vineyard, right? The managers, they don't build this vineyard, but they were allowed to work and to maintain it. 
The owner's the one that has the land. He's the one that owns the property. The owner is the one that set everything up from verse 1, right? He, he uh, plants the vines, he builds the fence, he digs the pit, he procures the tower. And, and all that the managers, all that the tenants had to do, the only thing they had to do was to produce fruit. That's all that they had to do. And so <coughs> the tenants would work the the farm, and within a reasonable amount of time, they, when the harvest came, they were supposed to give a portion of that to the owner. And there's, a, there's a, at least a five-year gap between uh, verse 1 and verse 2 if they were following um, Leviticus 19's uh, model in this, in this parable. This is several years later when the, when the owner would come back to collect uh, the harvest or, or his portion from the harvest. And so I want you to see in that that everything has been set up for success for the tenants, for the managers. Everything has been set up for them to succeed in this endeavor. There's been plenty of time for them to yield some fruit from the harvest. Plenty of time. And so the owner, what he does is he sends a servant out to come and collect rent. And here's what happens, verses 3 through 5. And they took him, talking about the servant, the tenants, they, the tenants took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty handed. I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is kind of crazy, right? Like maybe you've had a bad experience with a, a, a landlord before, but it probably didn't escalate, right, to, to this level when they came to collect rent or you as the landlord came to collect rent. Rent, rent, rent for them, but it's not too, too crazy because there are often disagreements, even today, between uh, landlords and, and, and renters, and, and most of the time it doesn't end up in a fight, but it definitely has come to that. And so maybe here, when the servant comes, maybe there's a, maybe there's a clashing of personalities. Uh, maybe, maybe the servant comes in and sees the, 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 the grapes that have been produced by the tenants, and maybe he says, hey, these suck. I like Welch's way better. We don't know. We don't know, right? But something happens between the, the servant and, and the tenants, and, 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 and he gets kicked out. And so the owner steps in at this point. The owner of the vineyard steps in, and he graciously sends another servant in. He sends in another servant to come check in on things, maybe to get a different perspective. And so verse uh, four, here's what happens. Again, he sent to them another servant. And to him, they struck him on the head. And they treated him shamefully. Servant number two is sent from the owner to the tenant managers. And, and to him, the same kind of thing happens. Except here, they're, they're throwing stones at him. That ends up causing some kind of head trauma against him. And then they're insulting him and, and they, they kick him out, basically. So what does the owner do? Same things happen to two of his servants. What does the owner do? Verse 5. He sends in another servant. And him they killed. So with many others. Some they beat. And some they kill. So by law now, this is more than enough. Created enough evidence for two or three witnesses to come against these tenants. There's plenty of, of reason for the owner to, to convict and to evict the tenants at, at this point for the way that, that they have treated uh, his servants who have come on, on his behalf. The vineyard owner sends that third servant in and, and the text says that they just kill him. And so as the, as the owner continues to send more and more and more servants, more and more messengers show up what we see is that the same kind of stuff keeps happening. Some of them are beat up, and some of them are even killed. And it's clear, it's clear at this point at least, that the, the managers of the garden have, have clearly uh, not been producing any fruit. They haven't created any fruit in the, in the vineyard. And, and so, since there's no fruit being produced, no grapes being matured along, the whole purpose of the, the, the vineyard has been thwarted, has been sabotaged by these tenant managers. And so let's step back from this story just for a second, you and me. Let's step back from this picture that you're building in your mind. Like, just on, on, on a basic level, if I'm the owner of this garden, if you're the owner of this, of this vineyard, like, I'm way past the point of patience, Right? Like, I'm way past the point of grace. I'm not, I'm not sending anyone else in unless it's the popo, right? I'm not sending anyone else to them. No more servants are coming to them. 
Luckily for you and, and for me, for all of us, this owner, he's not like that though. Instead, he's overflowing with this extravagant patience. He had a lot of servants, right? But they had all had come and they'd been unsuccessful in collecting what was rightfully the owner's. And so in this, in this last effort, the owner sends a final representative. It's an act of grace, verse 6. And he still had one other, though, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. And that, 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 that word there, beloved, this tells us, this reveals to us that this is both the father's only and favorite Son. It was a son that was dear to his, his father's heart. And so this is the only person that the owner has left to send. And so maybe the owner, you know, figures that since, the, since the, 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 his son has the full legal authority over the managers, right? The son, he's a higher rank than just the servants are. And so maybe the owner says that, thinks that they're going to give him respect. That's what the text says, actually. He says they'll have to respect him. And so in this final attempt, the owner goes to collect what is rightfully his by sending his beloved son. And this is their response to his son, verses 7 and 8. But those tenants, those managers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Verse 8. And they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. For the owner who's built, envisioned, designed this vineyard, everything in it has gone horribly, horribly wrong. And so the owner sends in his son to fix the problem, yet when the tenants see the son, when the tenant managers see the son, it, it, it somehow wrongly led them to conclude that, you know, well, the landowner, he must be dead. Because the son has shown up and not the owner. And so they end up talking amongst themselves in the text and they conclude that if they assassinate the son, okay, if, the, if they will just assassinate the son, then they can claim the owner's property as their own. But let's be honest and, and step back from this for just a second again. The, 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 the tenant managers, they, it's this jealousy, it's this greed, it's this want, it's this glossity. Those are the kind of things that cause human beings to desire things that they don't need. And it makes us believe that this lie that our desire should be fulfilled at all costs. And when that happens, what usually ends up going down is that we perform this great reversal. And, and, and so with God's people, with God's stuff, because right, you can either, you can either use money and, and love people or you can use people and, and love money, but you can't do both. And so maybe the tenants, maybe they believe, you know, the owner, he's, he's, maybe he's, he's dead since the son showed up, or maybe they think the owner's too old or too far away or too apathetic or that he just doesn't care. And so technically, by the rules of that day, the tenant managers, they could inherit this land that they'd work if no heir came uh, to claim the, the, the property or if they were dead. And so they just kill the son, it says, and they throw him out without even burying him. What will the owner of the vineyard do? That's how verse 9 starts. What will the owner of the vineyard do? And here's the answer. He will come. And destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. And so we find out real quickly that this owner, he's not apathetic, that he's not distant, that he's not disconnected. But, but in fact, this, this, this owner, he's, he's certainly not dead. And, but there's going to be a drastic, drastic consequences to the tenants for what they have done. And so Jesus, he actually provides us the answer in his, in his parable. That the tenants, they're going to be forced into submission. And that the owner, it says that he will come and destroy those who refused and rejected his messengers and ultimately also his son. And verse 9 is where I want us to sit down at this morning. This is where I want us to chew, chew this around, to wrestle with it a little bit. And so pull your, pull your cheat sheet back out if you have it. Let's, let's recap again. The vineyard. The vineyard, right? This is Israel. This is the temple. This is God's chosen people. Later, God's adopted people. The owner of the vineyard is who? God. 
The, 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 the terrible tenants, who were they? The religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. The servants were who? Right, the messengers, God's prophets. And then the beloved son that, that, that was murdered is who? It's Jesus. And so church, this, this parable then, 2,000 years ago, it most definitely was about the Sanhedrin. But, but also, it's about humanity right now. And I want to show, I want to show this to you. But for, so first, let's circle back to the vineyard. Let's circle back to the vineyard. The vineyard, it, it, it was, it, it is Israel. It's the temple. It's God's chosen and, and adopted people. And repeatedly in the New Testament, that, that phrase temple comes up. Say temple. And when, when it's used, it's, it's talking about you and it's talking about me. And I put one example in from 1 Corinthians for you. It says this. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? What this means is that your body, you are more than just a, a sack of skin. You are more than, than, than just that. But you, you are mind, you are heart, you are, are, are body. And, and so... Whenever the Bible uses the language of heart, it's not just talking about your blood pumper. It's talking about, it's talking about the, the place where you um, set your values, the place where emotions well up inside of you. It's the place that your passions come from. And so what God is saying to us through, through this as, as, as the vineyard, he sees it's the control center of, of who you are. And God is the owner, the creator. He's saying, look, I have built you. I have designed you. I have envisioned you. You, uh, mind, body, and heart to be a living temple for me. To be a living temple for me. And he's saying, look, I have entrusted you as the tenant to steward that well. That's what he's saying. I've entrusted you to steward mind, body, and heart. He says, I'm the proper authority over you. God's the owner, right? But he's saying that you're the steward. You're the manager of this. But here's the problem. Then and, and, and the problem now also is that you and me and every human being, we are both, we are both born into sin and also we choose, choose to sin. We are all born as the Sanhedrin. We are all born as the Sanhedrin. We are born as these miserable messengers who, has, who have rejected God's authority. And, and, and in place of God's authority over our life, what we try to do is we try to assert our own authority in that spot, in that place. And so, in light of that reality, I want you to look at verses 2 through 6, the, the illustration you, that God uses for his extravagant patience for you and for me. Verses 2 and 6, the, God the owner, right? First he sends a servant, then he sends another, then he sends another, then so many others come along. This is explained in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, uh, about God in this way. It's this beautiful contrast. It says, note then the kindness and the severity of God. And I love how those two, those two ideas are, are put together in Romans 11. And so let's start first with the kindness. Let's start first with the kindness of God. God, um, over, over the years, over the course of your life, has probably sent tens of hundreds, if not thousands of people to you to explain the gospel, to set the gospel in front of you. He has sent messenger after messenger and servant after servant. I, I, I doubt today is the first time that you have ever heard the gospel. If it is, amen. But there have been messengers that has come. If you've ever checked into a hotel and you've opened up the nightstand and there's been a little Gideon Bible, what they did is they set that in there so that you might be exposed to the gospel. If you've ever had a, a counselor or a teacher uh, explain to you or a child who Jesus is and what he came to do, that's, that's someone trying to reach you with the gospel. If someone's ever invited you here, it's so that you might hear the gospel. If you've ever been driving down the road and, and, and heard a song on the radio that was uh, beautifully articul articulating the, the idea and the message of the gospel. If you've ever had anyone knock on your door and hand you uh, literature that explained the gospel. God has sent many, many, many messengers to us um, to expose us to the gospel and call us back to him. God is extremely, extremely patient with us. Just think about how many have come over the course of your own life 
that God has sent to speak to you with, with, with his message of repentance. Anytime someone stands up here, Pastor Cody, uh, Pastor Johan, Pastor Isaac, myself, when we stand up here by the grace of God and explain to you the truths of God. Look, this isn't, this isn't Pastor Cody, Pastor Johan, Pastor Isaac, and Pastor Adam. No, no. That, that's Jesus. This is Jesus coming to you to claim what is rightfully his. And he has sent messenger and after messenger and servant after servant to, to, to call you back. God's gracious patience with us has been set on rerun. Yet in our rebellion, we have taken what is rightfully his and, and said that it's our own. And so what we deserve from God upon the very first rejection, according to the scripture, is death. The very first rejection, we deserve Death. Yet that's not what happens. Instead, God sends us his son. God, the owner, right, sends his beloved son, Jesus Christ, who came to claim what was rightfully his. This is John 1, 9 through 11. It puts it like this. It says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. And verse 11 should ring in your ears. He came to his own, and his own people didn't receive him when we see this phrase here in mark show up beloved son it's it's jam-packed with with biblical and and theological significance and as as jesus says these words he must have most certainly had had in in mind the language of his father that his father used at his baptism from mark 1 11 it says this you are my beloved son that same phrase that Jesus is repeating uh, showed up at his transfiguration when we went up on the mount with Moses and Elijah. And, and, and Mark 9, 7, pull that up. And it said this, this is my beloved son. It recalls the language of Genesis 22, 2, when God said uh, to, to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, who you love. It echoes the magnificent prophecy of Isaiah 9, uh, 6 through 7. That says this, for us, to us, a child is born and a son is given. And, and it kind of culminates in, in that most wonderful Bible verse, John chapter 3, verse 16. That he gave his only son. And, and I want you to see this because there's this significant difference between the servants who show up first and, and Jesus, the beloved son, who comes at the end, the, the, the servants um, that they come before Jesus, they're many, right? The servants, they were hired. The servants were the forerunners. But the son, the son, he's unique. The son is the heir. The son is the last one who's come as the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And, and what have we done in response to that, to Jesus showing up? We said, no thanks. We said, I'm good. And, and ultimately, the son is, is murdered and his body is thrown out of the vineyard. Do you understand, church, the judgment that Jesus went through on your behalf? The judgment that Jesus went through on your behalf. Don't, don't miss this. It's as Hebrews 12, 2 says that... Um, Jesus, looking to the author, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But what, is this, what does this mean that he endured the cross, that he despised the shame? Well, the, the shame of the cross, it wasn't just the nakedness that you know, Jesus was stripped of all. It wasn't just the nakedness. That's not, that's not the picture. The, the shame of the cross, it's, it's not just the pain of being beaten. It's not just the pain of, of being crucified. It's not just the crowd that's watching all this happen. That's not the, the big picture of the shame here. The, 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 the shame was in that the moment, uh, the, for the first time, the Father looked away from the Son. And for Jesus, there was, there was no worse thing. There was no worse fate than for the Father to turn his face from the Son. And so Jesus bore our shame in our place and died our death. And, and we know ultimately, right, that, that he, he, he rises up again three days later. And I tell you that not just for, for an amen, but so that you can see that Jesus paid the full payment for your debt. Like, Jesus is the OG student debt forgiveness agency, right? Like, he, he pays the sentence in full for all eternity. And he dies, and three days later, he, he rises again. It's this remarkable gift of God's 
kindness toward you and, and toward me. But I need you to see, I need you to see, okay, that, that God's kindness is inextricably woven together with God's severity. That they are, they are tied together. You, that you cannot, you cannot separate the two. In fact, I think when we, when we place them side by side, it helps us understand a little better. Because whenever you look at heaven, um, in, in contrast to the horrors of hell, it helps us understand it a little better. Whenever, whenever we, we, we look at mercy, it, we always see mercy more clearly whenever it's contrasted with judgment. We, 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 we see grace and appreciate it more whenever grace is juxtaposed with wrath. Whenever there's this backdrop behind it that lets us see clearer. It's the same reason that they put diamonds on, on black backdrops. is so that you can see the diamond more clearly. And so I need you to see God's judgment on our rejection of his authority. This is a non-fiction, okay? This is a non-fiction. It's why verse 9 of Mark 12 is the response to verse 7. Look back at that. Verse 9 of Mark 12 is the response to, to verse 7. The tenants, they reject the, the, the owner's authority, right? They slay the servants. And this statement from Jesus is because the, the, the Sanhedrin, they reject the servants of God. And, and, and it says, and God will now judge them. The window, okay, to change their mind has closed. That's the, that's the idea of this parable. And so for us, that means that our rebellion eventually has to be brought to justice, one way or another, I mean, momentarily speaking, right, there's a lot of injustice, okay? And like, earthly speaking, you may not receive justice um, for the things that happen against you. That's just the reality of it. But, but one day, we know that ultimately every injustice will be brought to justice by the perfect judge who is God. And, 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 and do you think that God the Father would really send his, send his son Jesus to such a, a painful and excruciating death if there was any other way for our rebellion to be, to be brought to justice? There's no way. There's no way that God would have ever done that if there was another way. But there wasn't another way. And so here's the only two options. Option number one. Jesus on the cross is draped in your rebellion. Jesus on the cross absorbs the wrath of God on your behalf. Therefore, whenever God looks at you, he sees Jesus. That's option number one. Or option number two is that you reject Christ and that you absorb the full wrath of God for your sin. And you have to pay the debt that you owe. Romans 2, 5 puts it like this. It says, if that's you. It says that you are storing up for yourself. Listen to that language. You are stockpiling, not, not hand sanitizer and tissue paper, but, but you are stockpiling God's wrath towards you when it comes to his, his judgment. And make no mistake, when God's judgment comes, it will come in this ferocity of, of, of a tidal wave overwhelming you in fury. Church, Romans 2, okay, Romans 2, this is a letter that Paul writes to a church. It's a warning. It's a warning from Paul. For us to slight and, and reject the, the, the Son invites into our life the wrath of God from Revelation 6, eternally. And for us, when that happens, Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. There is an incredible seriousness about this. There is an incredible sense of urgency attached to this parable. Let's wrap it up. Back to the parable. Verses 10 through 12, Jesus, he, he switches his parable. And it moves from a, a vineyard talking about God's people to a building, most likely the temple, to describe God's people. And here's what he says, verse 10 and 11. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Verse 11, this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here, this is Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verses 22 through 23. And, and, and Jesus, in this blanket statement, he says here, haven't you read this scripture? And he says that because he knows that they have. In fact, this was a, a, everyone would have known this scripture because it was a song that, that travelers, that uh, people who would pilgrimage into um, Jerusalem would sing as they came in. And in fact, when Jesus had his triumphal entry, they were singing this song. They were singing this same song, and Jesus goes, haven't, haven't you heard these words before? And so it's really well known, and, and the reason 
know that this verse is even attached to the, to the vineyard parable has to do with the word play that's happening in the Hebrew Aramaic for the word son, which has been, and I put it up here for you. It's a, it's a word play that's happening between the word son, which has been, and the word that's, that, that, that's used for stone, Eben, which is the focus of these verses. Right? And the focus of the, the first one was the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard, and, and, and the second one is the stone. But not just any stone church. What did the text say that Jesus was? He's which one? The cornerstone, which is the, it's the head of the corner. It's, the, it's the, the capstone. It's the most important stone in the entire building. Pastor Cody did a sermon um, in Songs of Our Songs of Summer series that we did. It was called Build My Life, and he talked about this a little bit. And so if you want to learn more about the cornerstone, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it, but I just want to encourage you to go back to the, our app and, and check it out there, and you can find out more about, about the cornerstone. But just hang with me on this, this stone, this building thing for just a second. Okay, if God's people are metaphorically, if God's people are metaphorically this building, if we're, like, we're the, the, the temple, and, and the stone was Jesus, who the text said was, was cast aside as worthless. He was cast aside. This stone was cast aside and rejected by the builders, the religious leaders. Then this is, this is Jesus in this text. It says in this marvelous reversal, getting vindication from God as God takes what man rejects and he sets Jesus as the main stone. He sets Jesus as the cornerstone. This is a symbol of the Messiah here. Jesus is yelling out. He's going, I'm the Messiah. Jesus knows exactly who he is and exactly why he he has come. And he wants the crowd and the Sanhedrin and everyone listening to hear that message. In verse 12, And they, the Sanhedrin, were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him. And went away. Here in verse 12, these religious leaders, these farmers, these tenants, these managers, they hear what Jesus has just said and they can't can't fully wrap their brains around it. They can't fully understand what Jesus is saying. But what they do know is that Jesus is talking about them and they're on the losing end of it. And so they sense that Jesus is telling this parable against them. And so it says that they start conniving. They try to figure out a way that they can arrest him. And, and literally here, they're like the demons from way back in Mark chapter 1 that acknowledge the existence of, of God but are, are so stubborn and, and set in their ways but, and then refuse to submit to his lordship. And they, they try to come up with a plan on how they might destroy him instead. And, and I don't know if you caught this or not, but the leaders are trying to do exactly what Jesus said in the parable that they were going to do. And so they move ahead with their plan to murder the son that's sent by God. Later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about this. and He's talking about this picture of the, of the stones. And he says that, that, that explaining this and this was foolishness. Um, that, that how even though Christ was a stumbling block for them. That he's actually the power of God for his salvation for us. And so Jesus, this rock that was once viewed as worthless, gets set in this position as the cornerstone, and the, the, the Jewish people, they trip over it because they can't, they can't grasp that he's the Messiah. And I share that with you this morning because I want to remind you that God will always win. Even when for a fleeting moment it seems like he is lost, God will always win. Every plan he puts into motion will come out exactly as he intends it to do. When he speaks, it's already done. But, but, sometimes scoffers take advantage of God's extreme patience. Just in that he's weak or that he doesn't exist or that, you know, the timetable doesn't matter. And as I was sitting down on this, I was thinking about, you know, God's people rejecting him. And, and of course, I thought about the story of Noah in the scriptures. Right, Noah, Noah comes along as this messenger from God, this 11th hour prophet to speak to, to God's people about, about this judgment, this impending judgment that, that's coming down on them. And, and so God sends this servant out and, and, he, and he tells Noah to tell the people that, 
that, hey, you need to submit to the authority of God. <laughs> you need to repent. You need to change your mind. That's what God tells Noah to, to tell the people. And, and, and so Noah, he says to him, look, if you, don't, you don't, if you don't do what God's asking you to do, here's what's going to happen. The sky, it's going to open up and, and, and water is going to pour out of it, which was crazy because they had never seen you know, rain before. And, and Noah's talking about, hey, it's, gonna, it's not just going to rain, but it's going to come this, this flood on on your rebellion, and, and then it gets even crazier in the story of Noah. As, as he's building this, God tells him to build this wooden ship in the desert that's not even close to a body of water. Um, and, and the ship serves as this symbol of salvation where, where Noah is, is saying to the people, repent, change your mind, submit to God's authority, just get on the boat. But we know, right, we know what happens, that that ultimately the people refuse to submit to the authority of God and that God floods them with the judgment of his wrath because he's the perfect judge and there has to be justice. And and I wanted to remind you of that because I know that, that some of you today, you probably have come here you may have, you know, asked Jesus into your heart when you were four or five or six, and, and, and it was really just an escape hell kind of thing. And I want to, if that's you, I just want to tell you, that's not the gospel, okay? That's not, that's not the gospel story. But in me saying that, also make no mistake that one day, every single one of us will, will, will come face to face with Jesus. And, and, and on that day, when he returns, it's inevitable. God is going to collect, right? He's going to collect rent. He's going to collect those who are his from his his vineyard. And like you are either going to die or Jesus is going to come back. It's inevitable. One of those two are going to happen. And you're going to see Jesus face to face in, in that moment. And all that's going to matter is if you've submitted to the authority of God mind, heart, and body, if you've submitted to his authority in your life, not a perfect obedience of his authority, just the disposition of your heart, have you submitted to his authority or have you rejected it? That's all that's going to matter in in that moment. And so like Noah today, I just plead with you to get in the boat. 